Hello everybody, it's Dave Herman, alias Daz, the artist. On June 4th, 2021 at 2.18 in the afternoon, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of the interface of my Affinity Designer. So this is the current piece, uh, one of the many whips I've started, works in progress and work on from time to time depending on artistic problems I want to solve and things I'm thinking about and researching. So this is the cicada and the clover. So right now we're going to work on the lower ring wings today. Excuse my grammar. We're going to zoom in on that. Now eventually I'll get to the back of the body, but I just roughed it in there so it's solid enough to see. And then going from a visual reference, I'm going to start to draw in this bottom wing, which hopefully I can do in the next hour. Everything you see is a digital art using brushes. I select to give it a painterly look as though it was traditional analog art, as we call it. Made in the real world, but this is created digitally with the same effects of a masterful painting, but maybe not so masterfully done digitally. <laughs> but let's uh, throw in a leg and some wings. So first leg, uh, I'm going to go to the top and I'm going to add a new layer for that so I can continue to work in a non-destructive manner, which means I can edit anything I want to edit. <laughs> Pardon me, pollen has been getting to me off and on all summer still, all spring. As soon as summer gets here, hopefully by June 21st, it'll all be done. Falling out of the trees and killing us. <laughs> Figuratively. All right, brushes. Let's go to gouache. And one of my go-to mediums was gouache when I used to be a traditional artist. Okay, so this is the uh, third brush down in the gouache on canvas. Brush selections of Affinity Designer. If you're on the first button here in the upper left, Designer Persona, you won't see those brushes. So you've got to be in Pixel Persona. Now we go to the color. And I jump back and forth throughout the colors, but you can watch me build a leg rather quickly. So I'm on my top layer, and I'm going to introduce a leg. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Edit, undo. I was on arrow, I guess. Um, I'm going to have to close this for one second and reopen. File close. I'm going to tell it not to save anything because something happened there. And I, when I do a blunder like that, if you haven't made a save, it's, it's a good idea just to close it and not confuse the system. So back to making a new layer. I hope that uh, helps you if you ever do the same mistake where you just you know, toggled something you didn't want to toggle. And uh, rather than go back and save and all that and mess up your master copy, which you could save another copy under a different name, I had accidentally had this on the arrow, which is the move tool, when it should be on the brush tool. And sometimes these things change without me physically changing them. So, never quite sure what's happening. Because these apps do do things you do not initiate. That's a fact. They all have glitches. I don't care what program you work in. There's little things that happen, and uh, you can spend your time contacting them, or you can just wait till they discover it. Because so many factors go into a glitch. It can be your own personal computer system. It can be the way the software is written. It could be if you've made modifications to your system. This is a particular high-end, out-of-the-box system that I haven't modified. Unlike my laptop, which I've done extensive modifications in both uh, hardware and software, too. 
So um, now we're working on this leg. And I'm looking at an off-screen reference just to uh, get my mind in the groove, start thinking about today's drawing, how I want to modify, change, alter. Now say I want to erase something, I just go to the eraser. If I want something more slender than I made it or take it out of the picture, you're watching me erase right now. None of my videos are edited. That's number one. Uh, the only problem I have sometimes, if I introduce music, I have to have it removed. It's so complicated how Google and all these artists, uh, musicians, mess with you. You know, it says like a royalty-free site. You've taken to use the music. Then they claim that you used it without their opera, you know, without their authorities so that they can get paid royalties on it and quite frankly nobody's really honest about any of it so this one's without music for a change so I don't have to deal with it because usually what happens I'll post the video and this is just FYI stuff nothing negative I, I post the video and what happens uh, after it's posted and it's ready to go live, then it tells me uh, no infringements. And two days later, it says, oh, infringement, 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 infringement. What do you want to do? Don't worry, we're not going to punish you, but you can't make any money. Oh, don't worry about making money because you're not really a monetized guy. But if you ever reach monetization, you won't get any money. Then they tell you that the company has, like, a, that you used a royalty-free company. They're claiming that they should get royalties from YouTube. And so what it is is just a giant con game that none of us can figure out. So one day, um, maybe in 10 years or something, if I ever get enough money stash and decide I want a drum set I have to move to the country where it's wide open space and nobody can hear me but I would definitely go back to playing my drums and put that in the background just uh, you never know who I'm gonna run into my whole life could change once they get a handle on COVID but I still think of COVID as a plague so as a person in the medical field a, a tattoo artist very cautious about the whole thing. It's not important to me how it started. It's important to me what we do to deal with it. And the amount of information and disinformation is astronomical. So right now I don't have any like major feelings that we're done with it. I, I'm expecting a huge resurgence. That's just me. And if that happens, <laughs> I would be sitting here forever doing this. But I do, in, in, in the early fall, intend to reopen my shop. I'm still waiting. As all these young people uh, come down with it, as 21 states are not getting vaccinated, and so on. And this is not about the vaccination stuff. I'm just saying, we're not out of it yet. Which, you know, I utilize my time for my art. You're watching me do some, like, just solar effects around creature in the air. Little halo glyphs, and then we're drawing down the, um, the limbs of the insect. All the way to its tarsus, little fingers. And I'm analyzing the length of the segments and so on. So it's fun. I've learned a lot. But then I'm a self learning kind of guy, you know? So for me, the internet's great. It's like a library. 
Not only is it like a library, there are people I never would have met in the world that I have actually made personal contact to uh, with shared common interests, whether it's tattooing, uh, the research of ancient archaeology. Recently I've made some very good contacts with that. There's a one guy left I need to try and get get to, but uh, they're very hard. <laughs> Once I get there, everything's good go. But um, there's one more guy I gotta hunt down, and that that's kind of exciting to me every now and then when I get into just detective work. Because it's everything's out there on the internet. It's a very what I call a Zen event. It's not just asking the questions. It's how you word your question that it finds the search answer. So it's in a for sure you can search anything, even if it's hidden. If you could ask the question in such a way that the answer is concealed in the text of the document you seek to find. But the search words themselves are not enough. So there's something that goes on. There's some kind of magic that eventually takes place. I don't know how it does it. But then sometimes I go, oh, holy cow, there's the guy. There's the email. And if I, if I write them generically, let's say I'm... Uh, trying to track down a scientist, or an engineer, or an astronomer, and ask pertinent questions to me so I can continue my own research. Um, often I'll write them and they'll say, you may contact me direct at this address. And I go for it, and sure enough, it's the person. So I find that quite a blessing that the internet gives me that ability. I never leave the house to do the type of research I gotta get done for the things I'm studying personally. Which is the origins of man in ancient archeology, span ancient high tech, heck, high technology, and exactly how man moved about the globe after the last catastrophe 12,000 years ago uh, the Younger Dryas as it's called so when the earth was flooded where the poles quite possibly shifted but it's hard to say I believe the pole shift was 60,000 years ago so anyways I digress there's the wing and uh, just taking a quick study and yeah, save file save I'm yeah, cool with that kind of interesting Now, uh, there's going to be some highlight on the carapace above that wing. Stick a little carapace highlight in there. These are uh, just enough light to reveal some textures. <sighs> like an underpainting or something. I, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a glow that's reflected glow bouncing off something else. Da -da 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 -da. All right, and a little popcorn out here. Just on the single joint socket. Hmm.
tell you, if you're me, you study a lot of stuff. I personally study animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdom as an artist, ancient archaeology, and ancient high tech as a kind of a pseudo engineer, pseudo scientist. Mathematics, to some degree, uh, as far as the base numbers that civilizations counted in. So the Mayans used base 20, the Anunnaki used base 60. And why do I study that, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you. Because if someone worked in base 60 or worked in base 20, then you should be able to see that in their creation. And you can. So that's uh, why I do that. <laughs> in addition to that, I may study the materials they constructed their projects out of. I am in contact with people that study it and have way more knowledge than I do have been to the sites. You know, I've only been to a couple sites in uh, Belize and in Guatemala um, a while back. But they've been, you know, to say 50 sites. And uh, I can say to somebody, uh, this is my conclusion of something as a hypothesis. What do you think when you're at those sites? And they can say to me, I concur. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about, which nobody does. You know, they're very polite, as I am when I communicate. And uh, pretty much, the people that are artists, the people that are engineers, uh, the rational thinkers, that use tools to measure what they find and use the vision of their, you know, that you have the skills that you develop as a um, working artist and stuff after technical training. I very much concur in the things that I've discovered, so I find that good, but it still doesn't give me any answers. It still doesn't give me the conclusion of what civilization actually crafted something or what happened to a civilization when they became extinct. You know, like when a hundred million Mayans disappear from the face of the earth, exactly what's going on. I realized, you know, the last of them were killed off by European civilizations, but prior to that, a lot of them went AOL, if you want to put that, missing in action, so MIAs. Okay, let me think. This is a fold here. The wind comes down this way. Hmm. I want that to actually come over more. So I'm going to bring it up here. There we go. And these are approximations. You know, I'm just doing a sketch from a reference. I don't, I'm not tracing it in this case. I'm not, it doesn't have to be photorealistically accurate, but representational enough to tell you it's it. Sometimes 100% uh, photorealistic is kind of boring, but everything you look at on the net it has been retouched. I mean, there's some things that say, I, I did not retouch it, so okay, you can study it and see if you agree or not. But most things we observed have been re retouched to some degree because when you start to copy them, uh, once your eye is trained, you can see where they've airbrushed. 
say the color breaks a pattern or you're following a natural line of a broken wing and you can see the you know where it's been repaired or changed or modified by an air by an artist um, doing corrective work around here with many things and that's leading me right now to modify completely the angle of a wing that I roughed in. Right now I'm just making the, uh, the vein connections of uh, parts. And if I like something I create better than what's there, I will go with it. But that's not the goal. So sometimes it requires a dramatic change, a really dramatic change, in which case this part of the wing needs to be modified. So let me click out here and then click here and then take the eraser and erase. Let's see. So I want it to be here. This is the non-destructive work where you find the layer you're supposed to be on and erase. Very tricky here. We're getting there though. Okay, see, so there's somewhere I'm erasing down at the bottom. I want to get rid of this brighter orange part. So I'm going to keep trying to find something here. very mystifying. So I will start um, what's going on here. If I put that in, hmm. interesting. Well, I'll leave that off for now. See there I can see my bug. If I turn that off just for a minute, I'm going to turn off till I find the layer I want. In a wing. Because it's there. It has to be found. These are all petals. There we go. So some is on that layer. I'll take my eraser and tackle that there. Some of that color. The sketch. Is that layer. So this is. There we go. Getting rid of some things, not much. Yeah, I think it is. Okay, there we go. So 
I'm changing the shape of it. Oh, and that little bit of orange right there. Where is that? That's at the top, it tells me. Oh. See, so here I've been all over the place working. And um, just jawing and talking and not paying enough attention to find these things. But I will, because I worked in a non-destructive manner. In other words, when I was making a big change, I created a new layer. So I could go back and do this, because I'm roughing something in, just for the visual effect. But then when I go back and I start to fine tune it, and I don't want it in there, i got to be able to actually locate it and modify it. So that's a big problem. And depending on how you've done your artwork, your due diligence, see it's not finding. Um, oh, wait a minute, maybe it is. Let's try that again. All right about there's a faint orange, a faint black. Okay, let's try that. Yep. Okay, so now I'm going to turn everything, I'm going to turn it back on. I'm going to view this. Uh, view fit on screen. I'm going to turn off and on this other layer. Now it's rather dark. This is bright. Interesting effect where I went around and did that. I like my, I like the mood. Um, so right now I'm going to leave on the dark when I do my thinking. A little more contrast. I'm going to go back to working that wing. So first I'm going to do a save. I'm going to move that wing back up. I got a little bit of a black line I need to get rid of right there at the bottom. We're going to put the arrow on that right there. Then we're going to go to the eraser. Let's see if it takes it out. Yes, it does. See, it's removing at the very, like halfway up the wing towards the leg. See me erase. Then there's that little bit of orange in there. Click outside my illustration and then I touch the orange. It's showing me that layer and then I go to my brush. And I take that out. There's still residual black there. Let's go down a layer. got to find that. It's bugging me. Hmm. Ah, let's get the arrow one more time. Ah, it's way down there. Just take that out right there. Where was it? Hit the arrow again. Right there. Go to eraser. I'm on that layer. Uh, edit and undo. Nothing happened. It jumped layers. Let's 
try this tiny. So it's adding. It's actually taking off the background. Edit, undo. That's not the right way. Or it, it's locating the background. So I'm going to go up higher on that line and touch it with my arrow. And that's up there. Now I'll switch to eraser. And lo and behold, that is it. Because I don't want any residue like stuff. Can't stand it. It drives me crazy. Just in case. Just in case I wanted to produce it larger sometime. Um, I don't want things showing up that don't belong there that I got to track down and fix. You never know who would find this illustration interesting and contact me. It hasn't happened yet, but in the anticipation of being a professional all the way through, I do this. Now, you wouldn't have to do it, but uh, I do it just because it's the way I think. And sometimes, you know, tidying these things up, they can take a minute, but consider it productive time. Because it's all part of the end result you're getting to. I don't want a bunch of stray lines. I don't want a bunch of crappy stuff. There we go. File save. Now, let's view it 100. That's actual size. This is a 9 by 12 uh, portrait. Or landscape. I'm sorry, 9 by 12 landscape. So I'm going to go back to draw now. <laughs> that I've done all that busy work. Sure, I'm in the right brush. And now that I've, I've changed the angle of this wing and the shape of this wing and bringing together some things, mm -hmm. so there's that, 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 and then this being black, right? comes across here. Doesn't bother me too much there. Fold, fold, extended. And then this can come down. Because when the wings do unfold, they're different than you anticipate. I'm going to come down like that. And taper like that into there. Okay, that doesn't bother me too much. Now, the top one, I'm going to get this outline a little bit better. And then I'm going to go to work on these. So this is stuff I would do, and stuff I did, and right in front of you. So this is how I do it. Um, it's not all like a guy just hits his brush stroke and he's a genius and it's perfect. Every stroke is perfect, you know. <laughs> Hardly. Hardly. A lot of do-overs. A lot of, because I'm freehanding it, you know. A lot of, you know, just tapering, torquing, turning. It's a lot of little busy stuff. Uh, and there's a couple ways that the wing does its thing, so. Just 
breaking there, coming across. Then it fans out one. something like that. Erase some of the external stuff there. Keep it tidy. And then it's a scalloped edge, sort of. So you've got that going on. Where this becomes more scalloped at the tail of the wing, at the last part of the wing. It's pretty complex. Like that. And this structure is a little more adamant here. A little more defined, let's say, and this one's a little more defined, this piece over here, which bends back. Oh, it's so complex. Okay. I want to tidy up some more. I'm going to hit outside the illustration, touch that, get my eraser into there, Yeah, it's a lot of work. You gotta be into it. Mm. Or you can just say, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna work on something like this. You know, again, these are complex things. Depending how fastidious you are as an artist and how much you want to get done. I work at my own pace and God knows I'm the slowest artist there ever was. All right. Let's put the orange into the structure. So this is complex in itself. Kind of uh, the top wing. Or there's so many wings, but there's like just the build out of the structure comes down and tapers to this part. And, and then it attaches somewhere in here to some other part, to another part. This kind of blends this way. And there's another part. And then this wing separate from the top. Separate. So the structure, uh, I'd have to look up what that's called. The bar part of the wing that the more delicate part is attached to must have a name. Um, so, you know, there's like an upper structure, which would, if you were making it out of balsa wood, like an airplane or something, you'd have that and then you'd have your paper attached. And the part that's the structure, it must have a name, you know, like the skeletal structure to which there would all the transparent stuff is attached to. And that, um, those have names, I'm sure. I'm not going to look them up right now. <laughs> you may look them up when you're playing with your illustration. And yes, I am munching on some gum. See, there's a lot of stuff to keep in your mind when you do this. It is mind-boggling, <laughs> to say the least. What it does to your mind is just not right. It's so much thinking. See, now we separate from the torso. A little bit of light in there, but no 
all lines. So you don't want a connecting line. And then I can soften that into the um, into the bloom by going all the way down to the bottom where the bloom is. I can draw some yellow in there right behind it, see? And I never touch the wing itself. See how that works? Now I can erase too. And never affect the torso or the wing or anything because I'm on a layer underneath, see? Very cool. All right, we're going to go back up to the top, and we're going to create a whole new layer now for starting to work this wing. Infinite nuances now. Infinite. And those are subtle rings. Uh, we're going to be up at the top. Sorry, I don't know how it went down there again. Am I up there? Am I, okay, I want to be up here. Don't mind me, these layers can make you nuts. But they're the only way to do it. Because then it's, you can totally work it. See how I'm working the details, the fine, fine details? Yeah, it's a ton of patience. That's correct. And uh, there's some ambiguous stuff. It looks like ambiguities, but they're, it's part of the way the structure works and then how much you want in focus or out of focus. And you know, how much you want to suggest or let light hit or, oh, it's so tricky. You've got a soul wanting to do it. Now, when I get to a point where I'm happy and I can magnify finally, that's good to me. And a lot of times, if you want to match your color, you would just use your eyedropper. But uh, there are things I want to do. So let's say I wanted this dark background in between the wing and there. I'm going to take the eyedropper. I might touch this. See that color? Then I'm going to go back to my brush, and I would put that right in between the body of the cicada, and come across like that. And then later it might get to be very dark in there. So, we'll just shape a little bit of that to remind me to get down to that. And there can be some kind of a residual look, like if it's in motion, if it's in flight, you know, if it's just lights hitting it, there's a little bit of a, you know, even though you stopped it as a frame, there can be residual light bouncing around and, and dramatic stuff going on that looks like a trace of an image or something like that, you know. So we're going to go up again, this time here. And we can make a partition there are some partitions here mm -hmm. it's one part of a wing under another part of a wing it's also tricky Just how you do that is up to you, you know, doing what I want to do. You will represent. But you can see. And especially if you, you know, you can just slow these down or speed them up. Just watch me work. Because I don't, uh, I don't edit. So it allows you to see very slowly backwards and forward what I'm, doing exactly 
Exactly. You know, you don't go back and say, oh, it, it jumped, it jumped, it glitched, it something. No, it's all, it's right here. <laughs> In all its magnanimous imperfections, mix-ups, and so on. And don't forget, this will be um, like at 100. Right now we're at 186, if you see up there in the top of the ruler. So if I go view at 100, it would be like that. See, and you're not going to see all our imperfections. If that was, you know, the finished piece of art at 9 by 12, 300 DPI. Landscape. All right, view. Go back to 200. I know, I don't make much sense. You can have a lot of fun doing these, and you can have a lot of fun being your own editor. You know, building uh, these wings have so many subtleties that no matter how you do it, you're just forever modifying, and your eye gets better and better at looking, and so on. So you have to have a lot of patience to do this artwork, obviously. You know, if you're picking, uh, if you want to be a guy that does anime or anything else, then each of those disciplines have just an infinity of things you got to learn. Because then there's protocols of the type of the anime and uh, or the type of the robot. Is there a torquing, a twisting of the cellophane of the wing? How much can you exaggerate, you know, the flex or the way light's captured for some reason? All up to you as the artist. And your, you know, enhancements, exaggerations, they all work if you do them I mean, everybody sees every object differently. And even a photograph taken by one guy is different than the next because of all the aperture settings and everything. Reality is just in the eye of the beholder, truly. But we don't want to deviate so much that you look at it and you go, that just doesn't seem right, man. What's wrong with that? You want it to look right. I do. So it's a lot of discipline, a lot of patience, a lot of this taking your time to create. jumping all over like because uh, that's how it works a lot of times you're just trying to you're getting somewhere I'm not sure exactly where you're getting but it's starting to work and then you can see you're not a hundred percent exact but you've made the suggestion that's believable and it starts to work that's it that's what I say and we got to get rid of the shadow. So those coarse, you know, lines like they see me erasing right now. 
when I did my rough sketch, I used too thick of a pencil or a brush stroke or whatever digitally. Should have been thinner. But you know why I do that is because I like smoothing them out later and bringing it more correct to what it should be. Because then sometimes I see it differently. I see it as a shadow or I see it as a, a line that could be part of the wing. Or I see different things in the way I create stuff that I never did when I first started. So. It's all good. It's all good. Overall, I may lighten this again or darken it once I get it in. I'm just sort of building and exaggerating some highlights and stuff because it gets re reduced real small. And now I just want to uh, want to understand what I'm doing. So this actually comes out up here. It is complex. Let me tell you, drawing a wing is so complex. It's all good. It's all complex. This is almost a square shape. So I'm going to have some uh, something here coming to here, coming back here, coming down, a little broader out here, and then taper like that into that wing. Okay. Then I'm going to lighten it up a little bit. Here and here, just till I there's going to be more orange, but I want to define the form right there. I can have it come out to here if I want. I can if I want. So instead of erasing, a lot of times I might draw over something. A lot of ways to skin the cat, as they say. You know, you will develop your own uh, tricks that are personally your trick. You know, and sometimes you may never do things twice the same way. <laughs> I'm like that. I just am in a perpetual discovery. Don't know why. But a lot of stuff I do is just so complex, I don't really, I don't commit nothing to memory because I see it different each time I do it. And that adds a certain vibrancy to one's work instead of a stagnation where everything looks alike. You just kind of, I think it's better to try and see everything fresh. I'm not a formula guy. If you look at the art on my website, it's so much and so varied, and there's over 500 uh, illustrations that, you know, I tackled each one differently, like a, I just woke up from being born. You can see this is so much, the whole wing is just a drawing. Somebody just drew it. And uh, I'm redrawing it my way based on their reference a little bit. Um, it's okay with me. It's okay with me, you know?
Put some structure in there. It can line up. It doesn't have to line up. It's going to be torqued in flight. It can be twisted. Stuff's going on, you know? Stuff is going on. Light's working its way in. Let's go to another layer. So I can kind of separate the lighting from some of this. I gotta go back and rework in the. Maybe I make it a little more dynamic than it is, just for the uh, art purpose. Also trying to remove the static nature of it. You know, I want it to be a little more in the motion without like in a cartoon how you add motion, those outside vibrating lines. I just want to do it by some is in focus, some's out of focus, some is you know. And we use this lovely painterly stroke of this brush to uh, enhance the paint quality of it. You may think all oh, this is gibberish. It's up to you. I'm doing the best I can do. That's all I can tell you. work it's work it's like to tire you out you feel beat <laughs> it can make you feel beat let me get down to the uh, the bloom area I just want to lightly do some stuff here non-scientific just my own little thing save Make sure I saved it. I did. Let's view it. Uh, it's starting to look pretty cool. Yep. Get the rest of that wing done. I'll take a two minute pause here. Get myself some water. I should be back. Sit tight, people. I'm back. I had a holy cow. I decided to go out and go grocery shopping. <laughs> Can't believe it. But I was hungry, so I did. And I needed to get outside. It's just too nice looking out the window. You're sitting here drawing. And sometimes, you know, since I'm not doing it for school, but I do it for my own um, improvement and growth, uh, I can go out and shop if I want to. So that's what I did. <laughs> go figure. The guy's crazy, yeah. So, back to this wing. Mm, I love how it's coming out, by the way. It's got so much potential. You'll see how I transparentize it all once I uh, get it in here. There's just too much um, thought process right away, a lot of thinking in these things. So, Lots of thinking. Next layer. Little crossbars and connections of the way things work. So, left hand working the express key remote. Right hand drawing. And uh, the very interesting potential. Let me just do that right now for the drop shadow of this part here. Let me just kind of Go up to the top and kind of drop shadow some black in there to show like a bend of the wing right there. Put a little popcorn highlight there. If you don't know where I'm at, I'm up near the body. Right? You'll see some yellow show up 
right in a couple of spots there. And it gives it the proper lift to this hard bar of the uh, what do you call it this piece of uh, anatomy of the insect I'm going up one more layer because it doesn't seem to be grabbing the way I want there we go let's just brighten that up a little color right there I have a brush huh okay then I'm going to go back to the green and black. The green Maharishi. Da, 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 da. Some kind of weird stuff going on right here. Black. There we go. I'm going to take that black and I'm going to go underneath that bend of that one structure. There we go. Just to create a little lift. Uh, a little bit of a shadow kind of addition the way I would do stuff. There you go. Now it comes towards the viewer a little bit. And if I put a white popcorn just right in the right spot there. On that bend. See that bend right there? We'll put a little light in those. Curious how that's protected. Something strange. Well, there we go. Well, that's strange. Let's do a save. I've got something that's not working just right. It's supposed to be drawing on there. Seems to be protected almost. Not sure why that is. How that layer is under. Oh, I'm way down there. Sorry, folks. Oh, yeah, I forgot where I was on the page. There we go. My bad, probably yelling at me, move it down, move the slider. It's like a fight. Move it, move. There we go. See the highlight to the right of the screen, almost near the edge of the border. <coughs> if I highlight that edge, now you can feel that it's like overlap. And then if I throw down a little bit of a gray green shadow, just for this little piping, kind of tuck it in there. Little more black, then it suddenly gets its lift. You'll see right there. So now it's coming towards the viewer. The top, <coughs> the top connection of this wing is uh, so starting to understand all these wings. There's lots of wings in here. Too many wings. Where are all these wings coming from? So we're going to move that to uh, lift, and we're going to torque this one towards the lift. A little darkness there. See, now I get the lift. Uh, you know, you don't want to fudge it, but you just, just enough. Like, push it back with the shadow, a little bit of that blue in there for stuff. And uh, now starting to get the realistic look I want because I am a hyper I can do the hyper realism too it's just so much time we want to put into a project and uh, well I would love to do this for a living or at least you know as a side gig work up stuff for some studio um, 
or have somebody figure out how to market me, that person can just contact me, you know. There's plenty of ways to contact me. I would do it through my art station. Go to art station, and it's uh, David, D-A-V-I-D, Isaac, I-S-A-A-C-H-E-R-M-A-N, on art station. And there's a way to business email people and stuff. So do that from there. Because I'm transitioning away from all these Facebook pages and stuff. I just, it seems uh, just not the proper way to use it anymore. It's, it's been infiltrated Facebook by so many scammers and fake people. And it just, uh, it had a good idea. It ruined it. Then it got political, then it did all kinds of other nasty stuff, so not many people were into it anymore. So they're all Instagrammers. I'm not really an Instagram guy. I just don't have time for that stuff. And uh, so what will happen uh, over time is I will transition out of that. I would say by October all my Facebook stuff will probably go down. And the only way to find me will be through my tattoo artist website, tatguy.com. And to find me on ArtStation as David Isaac Herman. For those that want to follow me. And that's how it is. I'm just not going to do it all. <laughs> I just, I'd rather spend the time even sitting on the porch staring at the trees. Because, why do I stare at the tree? Let me tell you. It's very important, I believe, to, if you stare all the time in a short distance, like you do when you're working on your computer, you need to go outside, and you need to stare into the far distance so your eyes don't get completely destroyed. At my age, they're already... <laughs> they're toast. The groundwork is laid for them to become toast. But, staring in the distance is the, the alternative to staring up close always, of course. And if you stare into the distance, you will help manipulate the mechanisms in the eye so that they're not focusing in the short, uh, up close always which is very bad for it. It's good to develop your up-close vision. Don't get me wrong there. But it's important also to exercise the muscles inside the eye, the actually the, your lens and stuff, to um, so that it doesn't get distorted just by staring at something very close all the time. And it's a big problem for tattoo artists like myself and people that uh, do close-up work all the time. If you notice, like surgeons, they got you know 50 layers of magnification and tools and stuff. And um, they stare into all that all the time. And then they're thinking. There's so much thinking whenever you do tiny work of things you just would not believe. Everything is scrutiny, you know, very close scrutiny, and you can become very much into up close work too, too much so that, um, you know, you, you, it affects your thinking, because you want to have the big picture, and the big picture is, you know, stand away, notice there's a forest before the trees, you know, as they say, don't just when you're in a forest, you can't tell what direction you're going or whatever if you're surrounded by trees. And in the real world, you want to uh, you want to know that there's a forest. And you want to uh, have some frame of reference away from the trees. Whether you climb up on a mountain and look out to figure out which way northeast, south, and west is with the sun where you remember that moss grows on the north side of trees or whatever 
you always have to keep the big picture in your mind. And that's why I say go outside, sit on your deck, your porch, take a walk. Get away from your computer and look into the distance. And another thing about looking into the distance is if you think of yourself as a man or a woman that thinks about the future, then looking into the distance will help you develop your powers of seeing towards the future. Now, I've lived in 28 places in my life, and the best one was when I lived up high on the water, but I could go right down to my, you know, I had a house that was, say, three stories. The third story was up in the air. One was the walkout basement, and, you know, there was a middle floor. And uh, even though I could get down quick, take my boat out, jump in the water, my little paddle boat, my rowboat. It was no gas motor lake. Um, when you sit up on the third deck, you know, you're watching the... It's it's just so amazing to see into the, the distance, think about life above. And uh, many times you get surprised that cranes would come flying around the corner of my house right past my face. A couple times in tandem, two together, just like B-52 bombers or something, or jets, I mean, and on display and they would just right around the corner eight feet nine feet from my head with their wings spread in tandem and uh, you know that will make your entire day if that ever happens to you and on the low side in front of my place I had many 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 years ago long since lost that became poor but when I had that um, there was a little teeny island you could walk to in front. The water got shoulder deep, maybe 50 feet out. And on that was always, in the fall, a cormorant and a crane that used to come and sit in that tree. Um, uh, not too far from each other. And they would be in a dialogue like it was like something out of a Japanese or Chinese painting of, of mystic birds and I used to love when they came in when that happened in the fall and I knew uh, you know winter was going to come um, I just loved it I just loved it so got that going we're starting to get uh, the minutia into some of this Because they are like butterfly wings, even they have all those, the little, man, I, I just don't know what the, all the, the spider web look, what they call that in an insect wing. I have to look that up, increase my knowledge, my knowledge base, my database, the brain of stuff. So save as, just save it, make sure it doesn't get lost, perfect. Yeah, let's go down a little bit. I keep wanting to go back and work that wing because I'm making it more hyper-realistic. And then I kind of like, um, I'll show you at the end what I do with the airbrush like I did at the top where I kind of fuzz it out. You know, if I move the hand of the brush, you can see how it's kind of like fuzzed out in certain areas. But it still makes you think that it's fuzzed out because the bug itself, the cicada's body is closer to you. The wing is just slightly out of focus and then this wing at the bottom is even closer to you so I have that in more focus and then the torso I'm going to work on just so it has you know pollen on it and things but uh, it's a complex piece of art and <laughs> man I got to put my due diligence into it and that's why I went out and did my grocery shopping and just got away from looking at it because when you're me, you can stare at stuff too much. And then it does affect my vision, whether it's not, if, if it isn't in hyper focus, number one. And number two, you become myopic in your thinking. In other words, you're just thinking of one uh, 
the potential is not there for all the cool stuff that should be you should be seeing. Um, and you can even imagine and throw in designs uh, because they do they do bend and they do flex and, they, and you you're on a vertices where these lines intersect and the wing gets distorted. So you're trying to convey that, and that's like a triangle bend. See, I could do that that way. I, I you know, this is bending up, the up plane. This is a down plane. This is a down plane, and yet you still have the sense of the integrity of it all. It's all connected, but you want to show some kind of torque without, uh, you know, being obvious, like when you're doing a box or something and you've got three or four sides of a box. You know, they're six-sided, of course, but you can only get, say, three sides into the picture because <laughs> you live in three dimensions. Let's not get into that. But you will, you will find over time that you will create your own dialogue for this stuff and make it work. You get used to your own flair. You see how these are single strokes? I'm just going... But I have to think about each one of those. You know, I have to. And that's, that's the hard part. Save. And the architecture of it all. You know, you're thinking about... I have these major pieces that outline the wing. I have, uh, you know, it's like a shoulder... Uh, it's like if you had a, a bat, you know how it has, it's like humerus and it's ulna and it's radius and it's hand. Well, insect, same thing. They got different names. And I'm not sure if I even know the name. I'll have to look it up and teach myself for the structure of these wings. But it is a thing. So there's some of that structure comes down the outside right here and separates again another another folding segment. And uh, this the interconnection and folding origami aspects of wings are just the beauty of nature, the power of the truth of design that comes about just by will. So if you were a, a thing in the mud and you wanted to get out of the mud and for generations you're sitting there thinking, I have to get out of the mud. You die, the next one's born and it's thinking, I have to get out of the mud. And the next one dies and it's thinking, I have to get out of the mud. Pretty soon it starts to grow feet. Then it's like you can scuttle along. It's thinking. I can make it. I can get to the land. I can get out of the mud. I have to get out of the mud. It really is an act of will. And so, so is so much more. And that's why you have to take your will and impose it. On you, yourself, as an artist, and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make myself, today, I'm going to get out of the mud. I'm going to teach myself a new part of art. Good analogy or bad, um, you got to make yourself do it. It really is, you got to, like, force yourself. You know, do it, do it. And if you have to walk away, like I do... You know, I'm in the middle of a video, I decided I'm going shopping. That's it. I can't take it no more. <laughs> I need I need some treats to eat, like a baked potato and a little bit of salsa and baked potato, some cheese. Oh, man, I was ready for that. Some fresh grapes, you know. So you got to get out and, and do that. And when you're shopping, I think of shopping. When I'm painting, I think of painting. So... I, 
you know, I'm in the shopping world, and I ran into somebody that I've uh, hunted mushrooms with, and uh, that person works in my deli at one of the places where I go. Not to be mentioned. But it uh, turns out it's another season coming up, and uh, he's already got himself some nice oyster mushrooms. So uh, I've never hunted those, and we're going to take me oyster hunting, hopefully. We did go for uh, chanterelles, and we got 10 pounds of those last year. <laughs> that was so good. I had 10 pounds of, in my freezer. I just would take them out. I used them in all kinds of ways. Preparing them was great. I did it old school, and uh, they lasted forever. I gave them away, some away as nice gifts, just a little Ziploc bag, of, you know. $20 of chanterelles for you. So, yeah. Now I'm going to learn about oysters. Which he, um, he can just hand rip those apart, he says, and then uh, you shred them and fry them, and they are like little french fries. So, can't wait to try that. I've learned a lot of stuff out here in the Northwest because I made myself get out and do things. I've been here 16 years. I've kayaked all over. I've bicycled all over. I've hiked all over. You have to, you just have to make yourself do it. And believe me, a lot of times it's an act of will, when you're, especially when you're like semi just lethargic. <laughs> Weather's gotten to you, season's gotten to you, or lack of cash gets to you, or something gets to you, or something's happened that you have to address. You know, anything that starts to wear you down a little bit or it's overbearing, you got to just tell yourself, you know what? If I died and I didn't solve this today, it probably wouldn't be such a big thing for the world. So. I think I'm just going to let it ruminate. I'll solve it tomorrow, and I'm going out for a walk. And you go out, and you take your walk, take your hike. I know these are videos about me drawing, and you're watching because you want to draw. But, you know, artists, artists have solo lives, and I'm trying to inspire artists as well. Even though I talk politics, I talk art, I talk psychology, it makes it interesting, like we're together in the studio as people, as humans. You know, not like I'm the mentor, but like I'm the guy that's just your buddy. You came over for some, you know, you're out of coffee. You want to come over and drink my coffee. You're, you, you, um, you read a good book. You want to talk about it to somebody. You know, people need companionship. Humans get awfully messed up if they don't engage so engage you can send me an email I don't care I even though the internet infuriates me at times when I see the same politics over and over if I'm turning on the news or whatever as a tool because I'm an investigative guy because I came out of a generation that had to you know use the world and not a computer and know how to go to a library and do research and know how to um, drill down the facts of stuff. The internet to me is really amazing, and I know how to use it as a uh, like a librarian, you know, as a, a tool that I can do research on. And the point I'm making is, I've actually contacted very people way up in the world through the internet, or made a complaint on something that's just infuriates the living heck out of me intelligently to the person to say, do you know that your, <laughs> your company's doing this? Did, have you even seen this? I'm sure you haven't because I know you're not going to do that. It doesn't make any sense as a human. And they write you back. We are on that. You know, holy cow, we did not see that. You know, we can't see everything. Of course, we're doing what we do. That person's doing what they do and so on. And, uh, you know, they call you a troll if you try and get involved, but not true. A lot of times I'll preface something with, I'm not a troll, but this is what I have observed. And uh, take it for what, what it's worth to you. But um, there's something wrong here. And I just don't like it. So, 
best thing you can do is do what's right for your soul. That's all I'm saying. You know, I really was trying to tell myself, you need to finish the video, you need to go shopping, you need this. And I just said, you know what? The art will sit there. That's, that does not have a time stamp. I, you know, it doesn't have to be done. It's not a dated material when I'm doing this. I'm not producing it for a car factory or something, so it didn't have any dated material. It's just my own personal art. And since I'm doing that, I can walk away from it. You can go to the grocery store, get your groceries, get your toilet paper, and get what you need and come back and not feel guilty. The not feeling guilty is the hardest part in life for everything because people lay guilt trips on us everywhere we go. And then, you know, if you say something and they just want to be nasty, they're going to say, well, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. I say ignore the posers, the people that aren't trying to improve themselves. Because you're here, you're watching this. One, either you love art, or two, you want to improve yourself and see if there's one little thing I do in this whole video that you can walk away with and add to your kit bag. I mean, I taught myself from the internet how to draw with digital art. I mean, I knew how to paint in the real world, but I didn't know any of this software. And man, I just walked around bonkers for years, just going, I'm never gonna get this, I'm never gonna get this. Now I'm coming into my own, and I'm able to inject my style, my art, the way I see, and also have the painterly effect in a digital world. I don't want it to look like puppet art. I don't want it to look glossy, slick. You know, I want it to look like it's real painting. Like if I print this out on a canvas at 300 dpi, then it's going to look like somebody painted it. And it does, I'm sure. But, of course, I don't produce them because it's too much money to just have them sit around. You need an art gallery carrying you. And uh, if I had an art gallery that promoted my work, of course I would do that. But I had a number of shows here when I was a uh, just a regular painter with my tattoo shop and my um, about eight, eight, nine years ago, I used to have my stuff in different galleries. I did maybe three, four shows out here. And, uh, you know, my painting sold when I was in a city where people had a lot of income. I'm in a particular city where they, right now, don't particularly have that kind of disposable income that they want to spend on art, or the last city they did. And uh, also, it may not be a place that relates to my art. Because I do some pretty far out science fiction stuff and figurative stuff. I came from a generation where drawing the human figure was not considered um, a perversion. It was, the human is the hardest thing to draw. When an artist can do beautiful uh, naked figures, that was considered somebody who could really draw. They really knew anatomy. And I'm not even a photorealistic figurative artist. I'm a representational. I do more abstract, but enough to tell you it's the figure, but without, you know, you don't see all the pores and you're not looking into the tear ducts and stuff like that. Not that hyper real, but definitely, you know, sold a lot of figurative art in my life. And then I decided to do this. I decided to go into the future. Because with the AI, digital art, shopping and buying everything off the internet, I had to learn it. And for me, it's uh, what I started to tell you was I've made contacts with very important people. I would have to spend a lot of money and travel the world to find at their backyard or something just by uh, hunting down their email or hunting down their websites and, uh, you know, suggesting a contact and the person will actually contact me and say, here's the 
email, what do you have to say, especially in investigative ancient archaeology, which is one of my hobbies, my passion, the study of humans, where we come from. All right, so let me stop for one minute and think about how I'm going to change this background. So I'm going to have uh, Mr. Han move this over. We're going down to the bottom to this See, there's a bottom pixel layer, then the next pixel layer has all that color to the left in the box. These things you see in the boxes are miniature illustration strokes. So each one of those strokes above all that color was when I was building the flowers, the clover pieces. But the very bottom here, this layer, this is my background. See, if I turn that off, see what I got? So now I want to add some yellow under the wing, and I'm going to show you. I can literally paint over the wing, but it will go under the wing. Watch. And it's under the wing. See that? And this is, you know, could suggest flight stroke and stuff like that. Um, just movement. So let me, uh, let me just view that uh, at a hundred. So there's the actual. And then I'll soften that with the airbrush. And I'm going to show you how I do that. So first I'm going to save. But there's this residual look. Now like it looks like you're actually drawing airways. And I'm going to soften that in the wind. So I'm going to take the hand and bring this over to the screen where you can see the entire cicada because I want that and then I'm going to uh, go to brushes we're gonna uh, be in brush we're going over to brushes we're going to um, basic at the bottom of the basic are like airbrush brushes as far as I'm concerned and then I'm gonna brush a brown like a nice just a uh, tone of brown. And I'm going to uh, shade with it just very quickly. Like that, see? And bring it into the, right over at the bottom, the image, like that. just to suggest um, the light trails, like it's a light trail. My own introduction into this. And it's over the bloom of the background. Or you could put another color flower in there, in the background, say like, let's go up one level above that and introduce just some bloom like this, see? And look at that. Now that's a little bit strong, so I would back that out. And definitely work great. So what we're going to do is, see where opacity is at 100? That's too much. Let's make that like 70, 60, 70. And then try and hit that again. Make sure I'm on the right layer. And just, uh, first I'll put a few drops of, of bumps like that in just light, and then I'll kind of go like that. And there could be a flower back there, so you, you can do like this. Like maybe it's going by a rose, because you got opposite colors of green and red, and now it has a lift. You know, it's really got, you're thinking there's a rose behind there, and it's lifting in front of that rose. And to do more with that, you could go to fuchsia, to darker color, let the red be your bright color. And just put a little fuchsia in here to suggest the petal shape very subtly of another plant behind there. And then you can erase back or you can put a light edge to it, like something like there. You see just enough to you can say, oh, I bet that's a rose in your mind. You know? Just enough like that. 
so cool. And then go even more towards purple. A little purple at the bottom there. So I've got a little splash, not too much, and then a touch of deeper shade of purple on top, like so. And then maybe some green that suggests a leaf. And uh, first we'll do a little dark, just a little like that. See, bring it, bring it in. And then some bright. I don't want a hard edge, but just enough to entice the eye into thinking something's there that it doesn't see, but it imagines it's seeing it. So, it depends if you want your bloom in focus or just, you know, you can do something like that. Put some shadow in there. I don't see why not. And so I'm just creating a, just enough of a leaf to make you think rose. It's a rose. And I don't want it to have a ton of detail because it will detract from my main object. But just a little so like you can tell it's, what it does is it tricks your eye to focus on the insect because now this is becoming predominant, like the leaf, you, your mind tells you, well, the leaf is closest to me, the rose is slightly out of focus. I'm suggesting some stuff as I get a little excited explaining. <laughs> but these are, these are mechanical tricks that, you know, they just kind of work. And it's not even so much what you would call a trick as you call it... Um, Technique, yeah, technique. Technique, yes. Yeah. Because this is the insect sees in the infrared and ultraviolet spectrums. Plants look different to it, you know. The plant created the insect. This is the hard thing to believe, um, that the plants make the insects. Hummingbirds are specific to their certain plants certain ones go to. And those plants created the beak and the hummingbird. They, there's one plant that only the longest beaked hummingbird on earth can extract the nectar from it. And the plant came first. And they believe that the, the plant modifies the, the bird. Because the plant wants to spread its pollen. Hope you're following me. Wants to spread its pollen in the world to... to proliferate. It can't do that unless it has a messenger to take the pollen. So over many, 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 many years, it created and modified an existing hummingbird to do the job. Just enough. We don't want just there we go. That's just a smidgen cool. And suggesting a rose. Just a beautiful flower, by the way. That's too much, that hard edge. you got to get that out at the top. All right, and that's safe. That's, that's decent for a moment. 
And if I wanted to lighten that up, I could. I could just put another layer over it and very subtly take a, a whitish pink. Take the opacity way down like that. Take the flow way down and then just kind of uh, splash some light on it. So watch, you just kind of so light's going to be coming through this painting behind everything. Let me move this. To, uh, so here's what we got to do. Hang on, I got to think this out. File, save, view, fit on the screen. Now I'm going to have one beam of light come right across, very subtly, left to right. So, see that? very subtle and it just hit it softer. Now I can strengthen that beam by taking the flow up sometimes it's funky okay there we go and I'm taking the opacity up and no hardness and we'll bring it across one more time from out there see now watch. Just going to put that on another layer even in case I don't like it. Like that. See? Just enough. And then we'll save that. And that's actually enough for this video. So I'm going to... Because the video is very long. How far are we into this? We are... Uh, yeah, it's almost two hours. I guess I can keep drawing. Let me uh, export this next stage. Export um, when I will, of course, lower the res because these things just fill up your computer. <laughs> And this will be number five, so we just click number four, keep the name everything the same, and just change the four to a five. And it's just like I type the whole thing over, and it saves a new image. Now I am going to pause to post these, but I shall be back. After thinking, I think I'm going to stop the video here because it's probably at least another two hours. So I don't want to have this video be so long, it will never process. But thank you. Everyone have a great evening. If you're watching this, I appreciate it.